So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to kind of welcome Dr. Abhishek Sharma, uh, who is giving a second seminar of our Waste Free World uh, Tier 2 Center. And this seminar series, we are trying to bring people from Australia, from national level, as well as from overseas, uh, who has expertise on uh, waste free related technologies and processes. So Dr. Abhishek Sharma, he has a uh, 13 years of experience in the field of process engineering uh, with his research interest is in a waste uh, valorization, alternate energy and multi-scale processes. He's a, a chemical engineer. So uh, being a chemical engineer, he has worked in a process design and development department in Engineers India Limited in New Delhi after complete, completing his bachelor of chemical engineering from uh, Malavia National Institute of Technology, which is one of the uh, kind of uh, technological uh, institute from Jaipur. Uh, and he has achieved his PhD from Curtin University. So he is very well known uh, with atmosphere of the Australian. He knows that Australian ac academic and research landscape very well, uh, since he has spent here a significant amount of time in Curtin. And then he work on Australia India strategic research funding as well as some ARC uh, uh, projects as well. And uh, he has published several journal articles with conferences and invited talks. And he has provided consultancies to industries such as the Saint uh, Gobain and Price uh, Waterhouse uh, Coopers. He is currently working as a professor in Department of Chemical Engineering at Manipal University Jaipur. So Manipal University is uh, one of the top most uh, private university in India and they have a wonderful campus in Jaipur. He's also holding a Dr. Ramdas Rai research chair position in the organization. He's the member of technical committee constituted under the Commission of Air Quality Management by Government of India for r and activities related to air pollution uh, in uh, NCR and adjoining areas. He has been working on this uh, technology development and implementation of this project on a waste to resource sanction by industries and Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. So he has a very strong uh, kind of tie up with the uh, Department of Science and Technology as well as uh, local industries. And he has solved some of the stories when I was talking with him, he is really giving the local uh, kind of solution to the local problems. So he's really well uh, familiar with these local challenges of waste and how to utilize those challenges to solve the problem. He has, uh, establishing a center of excellence for waste transformation with participation of Indian Chemical Council and other agency. And he has been working in this research area since past a few years and has been very successful. Uh, so today we are very happy to listen what uh, kind of the work he has done and what his aim and uh, kind of vision for his uh, this uh, particular topic. So now I'll hand over to Abhishek for giving a talk. Thanks. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, thanks for such a uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, am I audible uh, clearly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you. Great. So, and thank you for inviting me for this uh, seminar. Let me just share my screen. Yeah. <clears throat> That's fine. It's visible in the full screen mode. Uh, yeah, I can see it. No problem. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, as you mentioned that uh, the focus of this uh, series, uh, seminar series on waste free world and uh, the area on which we are currently focusing is on waste management and sustainability <clears throat> and how we can actually give integrated solution, technological solution with resource generation. So as part of circular economy. Now, uh, just uh, want to uh, like, you know, give a brief about the global issue, like, you know, in terms of numbers, uh, most of us are aware of the situation of waste, uh, especially municipal solid waste generated in different parts of uh, the world. So we're gonna look over here that, you know, uh, uh, annual solid waste generation is around 2 billion tons. Uh, that was in 2016, 2.01 in fact, and is rising to 3.4 billion tons by 2050. So it's a, uh, like, you know, it's a steep uh, increase if you're gonna look. Now, as far as the India is concerned, it's like standing very high with respect to the population as well as uh, the waste generation. So it represents around 18% of the global population and generates around 12% of this municipal solid waste. So with this, like, you know, 277 million tons of municipal solid waste being generated per annum in India, 
The problem is that only 26.6% of this waste is being, is being treated scientifically in the nation. And as you can see on the right hand side, like you know, the information given about the solid waste generated in different parts of the country, like, you know, so uh, in the top we have Maharashtra and like, you know, Uttar Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Puducherry. So, and then, you know, the other states are also contributing significantly in terms of uh, metric tons waste generated per day. And because of the proper management of this waste, so uh, you're going to see that, you know, uh, there are a lot of fire related problems happening in this uh, landfill area, which is also causing air pollution. So that is one of the uh, focus when I joined this, uh, like, you know, um, Commission of Air Quality Management, like, you know, how to curb this pollution in the uh, northern states, primarily nearby Delhi, which is quite common, like, you know, because of the stubble burning, because of this uh, solid waste burning <clears throat> or the fire, like, you know, uncontrolled burning, like, you know, uh, this uh, air pollution is increasing in that uh, region. Now, uh, let's briefly talk about the waste uh, which is being generated. Like, you know, primarily it's coming from three sources, uh, the residential source, uh, the industrial sources, and the commercial sources. Like, uh, for example, like the residential give you food waste, paper, cardboards, plastics, textile waste, industrial waste uh, is primarily housekeeping waste and packaging waste, food waste, construction and demolition material, which is kind of an inert waste, but it contributes to the mixture significantly. And then commercial waste also, which also includes some special waste and hazardous waste too. Now this waste actually uh, vary with respect to the income of the nation. So if you're gonna see from low income to high income, how the composition of waste varies. So in the low income countries or the, uh, the states, they are, we are having more food and green waste. But as the, we are moving towards high income, more amount of plastic waste is there more amount of glass waste is there, like, you know. So this waste increases, like, you know, um, and the, uh, like, you know, that affects the oral composition. So if you're gonna look at the oral composition, like, you know, uh, around 44% is the food and green waste. And like, you know, uh, then we have paper and cardboard around 17%. And the plastic waste is also significant over there. Now, the, the challenge which currently we are uh, uh, facing is uh, the segregation of this waste. So MSW, uh, which is solid waste is being processed, like, you know, at the source also, the, the way it, it is happening in Australia. I've been there for around five years, so I know we have different bins. We have to categorize uh, the waste accordingly and then like, you know, segregate it at source and then treat it separately. But uh, like, you know, there are challenges uh, in uh, like, you know, in India as well as in other countries as well in proper segregation of this waste. So uh, separation at source is one way. Then you separate and like collect uh, different fractions, which you're gonna just reuse. After that, like, you know, you go towards some particular fractions which you are using for energy generation. So for example, some of this RDF waste, which are generating, uh, I'll speak more about this RDF fraction in detail in my upcoming slides. Uh, uh, we use it for different applications like incineration and uh, co-processing and like, you know, other advanced uh, conversion. Uh, the organic uh, waste goes to anaerobic digestion and then to compost. The hazardous waste is going, is going for further treatment. Inert material is going to landfilling. So there are different fractions which are being treated separately. But the major problem which comes with MSW, like, you know, if you're going to talk in totality, is that, you know, you can't use MSW directly for different, uh, like, you know, ways to energy processes as well as ways to resource processes. The challenge is the high heterogeneity and the high moisture content uh, in this waste, which makes it very difficult to use for any uh, application. Now, if you're going to convert that MSW to RDF using mechanical and biological pretreatment stages, and that is a very important uh, part of the oral processing and the integration of this uh, treatment with, with other advanced treatment techniques is very critical. I'll explain it in detail in, in my upcoming slides. Uh, so as you can see that, uh, like, you know, RDF, which is a product of MSW, like you can say it is an intermediate product it enables better reuse of materials and recycling of MSW. And you can actually achieve higher efficiencies with respect to energy recovery using RDF. If you can look at the right hand side, like, you know, the dumping situation is, is, uh, is a big issue. What is happening, most of this MSW is directly going to unspecified landfills, around 25% is going over there. And with that, 33% is contributing to open dumping which is a common problem in the nation as well. Open dumping uh, in the landfill area is quite common due to which there's like, you know, waste catches fire in the, uh, in the summer season. 
So when you actually convert to RDF, the possibility of using RDF increases with respect to energy recovery. So uh, three primary stages, mechanical pretreatment, like you, know, you decrease the particle size, you do some ballistic separation, ferrous metal separation. Then you go to biological treatment to take care of the organic fraction, which is uh, mainly coming from the food waste. So you convert to biogas and compost uh, after drying. Then further refinement happens, like you know, shredding. Further shredding happens to reduce the particle size to less than or like you know, around 50 mm. Then screening happens to uh, separate the inert material, which is like sand or any construction demolition waste, which is coming with the feet. Then optical sorting for some metal, which you can remove and then reuse it or recycle it back. And recovery of ferrous and non-ferrous metals uh, as part of that. And eventually you get your RDF. Now, RDF is a, is a common uh, fraction or a refuse derived fraction, or you can say fuel as such is being used in a lot of cement industries. But the problem which you have noticed uh, in India while talking with the industry that, you know, this fraction is got, not getting very high value. It is around like, you know, uh, less than uh, like, you know, one INR, uh, one rupee, like one INR uh, per kilo, or you can say uh, around thousand INR per ton. So uh, the processing cost, like the mechanical, biological uh, treatment cost is higher than what you are fetching out of that RDF. And that's a significant problem, which affect the sustainability of this conversion MSW to RDF. Due to which, like, you know, different valorization techniques have been proposed for converting this uh, fraction into user products. So um, I won't go in the depth of each and every technique. I'll just briefly mention to you uh, because of, uh, like, you know, the time restrictions. Uh, like, you know, primary three techniques are there, pyrolysis, gasification, combustion, which converts this waste into different useful products, like primary products. And then further, uh, with further application, you convert into like chemicals and like, you know, uh, transport range fuels like gasoline and uh, like, you know, uh, other chemicals like ammonia as well as electricity. Now, if you want to just look at the parameters for assessment of these thermal processes with respect to uh, the scale of operation for like, you know, the basis of 500 tons of MSW being treated per day. So with respect to the capital and the operating cost, the most favorable one are pyrolysis and gasification as compared to other techniques like incineration, plasma gasification, and pyrolysis with gasification. In gasification, uh, as you can see, primarily you are getting uh, uh, gases, which you can further upgrade into uh, gasoline and like you know some diesel grade fuel as well as methanol. Uh, on the other hand, pyrolysis will uh, give you other chemicals as well. So uh, briefly about the conversion mechanism, like, you know, when you, uh, this MSW or this RDF fraction, which you're talking over here, primarily consists of uh, biomass uh, and plastics in it. So when you decompose biomass, it is mainly cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, you are decomposing and getting some valued products from there, like levoglucosan, you can get, purpurals you can get, which you can, like, you know, separate. And then you can also further uh, upgrade it using some catalytic processes and getting some other valued chemicals like uh, uh, phenols you can extract, glycols, syringols you can extract from there. Uh, on the other end, when you decompose plastics, you get like, you know, for example, from polyethylene, uh, you get uh, more straight chain compounds, which uh, like, you know, you can further upgrade also, as well as you can use it as a transport grade fuel. Uh, with respect to reactors, uh, like, you know, there are different configurations are available uh, with respect to the heat and mass transfer. Um, again, this is not the subject of discussion. I'll just briefly mention about this. Uh, like, so bubbling fluidized bed, a circulating fluidized bed, like, you know, the heat transfer, the, the velocities inside the reactor changes, and that affects the, uh, like, you know, the conversion, the rate of conversion inside the reactor. Similarly, we have other reactors like cone and ablative reactors and uh, rotary kill uh, type of reactors, auger reactors. So different configurations are available. You choose a configuration and then you work to scale it up. The most favorable one are the fluidized bed and the uh, rotary kiln type of systems, which are easier to operate. And uh, like, you know, we have uh, like, you know, the kinetics and the uh, other information are available with respect to reactor design using MSW or some of these systems. Now, when you talk about resource generation, uh, that is very important uh, with respect to uh, some of the techniques. Uh, so as I said that in the, end, in the advanced thermal uh, processes, the most favorable one are pyrolysis and gasification. And that is primarily because of you are extracting some value-added products from there as compared to incineration uh, in which the end product is heat energy, or you can convert that to electricity only, which is again a, a low value product. So as you uh, convert your RDF uh, using your uh, uh, reactor, so we have that kind of facility in our uh, campus. 
uh, working at different scales, uh, for, uh, varying from five to 10 kg per hour in a container system to 50 kg per day in semi-batch facilities. Uh, you get uh, different products like oil and the uh, one solid byproduct. The oil is having the organic and aqueous phase, which contains different chemicals, as we mentioned over here. Uh, so from wood and yard-based cardboards, paper, you get acetic acid, formic acid, purines, carbohydrates, 2 pyrrhaldehyde, levoglucosan. And from HDP, LDP, and polypropylene, polystyrene, you get uh, BTX and uh, other like you know validated chemicals from the rubber, uh, like also from tire waste on which we are also working heavily uh, with few industries in India. Uh, we get a lot of valued chemicals, uh, especially limonene and styrene butadiene. Limonene is in very high quantity in some of the tire waste, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, well, you convert that into uh, this uh, valued products. And textile waste also gives you some other uh, compounds. The solid product, on the other hand, has different applications, uh, like, for example, as soil conditioner and bioadsorbent. And on this area, we're also working uh, with uh, Prashant. We have collaborated with Prashant, and we have started working in that direction as well for different other application related to uh, the carbon value. Now, what's more important is with respect to the integration, the overall process integration. So when you have mineral solid waste, you convert that into compost, the organic fraction, as I said it to you, then you further treat it or refine it for separation of different components, like you separate innards, like the you know, sand and stone, which is coming from the construction industry. Then you separate some other fractions as well. Like for example, uh, some metal being separated, uh, after that, what you get is your RDF, which is a low value product. Now, basically your aim is to uh, improve these uh, pre-processing strategies, as well as how to reduce the operating costs to increase the revenues in this existing waste to energy facility. As I said, the value of this uh, RDF is low. So what you can basically propose to these industries uh, which are currently operating in these landfill sites, like you know, how to make the process economically and technologically feasible and sustainable for the longer duration. So as a researcher, that's our job. Now, uh, the aim is to convert this sorted MSW or RDF fraction to bio crude and uh, derivative fuels, as well as enhance the overall techno-economic viability of processes for unrecycled plastic, which is also part of this fraction. So we have uh, published some work in that direction, especially uh, with respect to how you feed this kind of material in your reactor. So after shredding uh, this RDF, uh, we have to further shred it to reduce the particle size to less than 50 mm. And then we are actually inserting it in our reactor for uh, conversion. But because of the fluffy nature and the low uh, density, the bulk density, the problem is to feed it using like you know, screw feeder. So uh, those studies have been carried out. And then we have uh, actually designed a modified feeder uh, for uh, like you know, pushing such kind of material inside the reactor. So it's part of the overall integration. And a lot of work is going in this direction as I'm, I'm a process engineer. So my interest is to actually scale up the processes and to understand the, uh, the minute engineering problems as well and how we can tackle that. It's not only that uh, reaction mechanism or like, you know, just the, the, like, you know, uh, the conversion behavior or like, you know, conversion yield we are interested in too. We're also interested in the design related problems. So uh, let's talk about briefly about scale up activities. We have started with characterization of uh, our feet. Uh, then uh, like, you know, doing some uh, TGA studies basically uh, for uh, analyzing the decomposition behavior, solid decomposition behavior. Uh, for that, like, you know, one of the publication uh, recently came out with our uh, collaborative effort with uh, Prashant and William Dohati uh, for elucidation of thermal degradation model for low and high density polythene. Similar kind of work we are carrying out with uh, other ways like biomass components, as well as different RDF uh, fractions as well. Now, after kinetic analysis, the aim of kinetic analysis is to understand like, you know, how the uh, solid will decompose with respect to time. And that will actually uh, affect the uh, reactor uh, designing. That's why this uh, information is very important for us. Then we go for thermochemical degradation studies in our uh, 50 kg per day uh, rotary kiln reactor. It's a semi batch system. And it gives us information about uh, the yield as well as like in a variation of yield with uh, temperature and other operating conditions. And then we're analyzing these products for different applications and also focusing on upgradation of these products in downstream. So ultimate aim is to convert your waste to uh, like, you know, uh, fuels and chemicals using uh, that kind of a, a biorefinery configuration. Some of the conceptual studies we have carried out using different kinds of waste, like coconut shell waste, which is pretty common in India. It gives a lot of value added chemicals like phenols, uh, cresols are there, 
in the oil fraction. The char is finding very high uh, value uh, from coconut shell because of uh, the surface area. Much for solid waste as well as mixed plastic waste. We have carried out these studies and uh, actually that is mostly with industries. So uh, most of the data has not been published yet. Now, when you talk about peat characterization, uh, for MSW, the challenge, as I said in the beginning, uh, there is variation in the feed quality. It varies with uh, season as well as with uh, uh, geographical location. It varies significantly. So what we have done, like, you know, we have taken different samples and then characterize our feed. So as you can see that in sample one, two, and three, the plastic waste varies from uh, 35 percentage to 85 percentage. And then in sample four and five, uh, it is going down. Uh, the sample four and five is primarily uh, contains the biomass fractions as compared to plastic fractions. And as you're gonna see uh, with the TGA studies, that it gives you an idea about the operating temperature. So uh, most of the fractions, uh, like which is your biomass contributes to uh, the weight loss in region between 250 to 450 degrees Celsius. And after from 400 and like 450 onwards to 550 and 600, you wanna have the plastic fractions. Uh, some unconverted will still be there. That is because of the lignin available in uh, biomass. So uh, this data gives you uh, information about not only about the uh, kinetics of solid state decomposition, but also the operating conditions for your uh, feed. Now we have carried out experimental studies using our setup, and uh, primarily, like you know, uh, based on our analysis of feed, we have uh, like you know uh, actually characterized our feed with respect to uh, the fraction of uh, plastics in it. So we have a low plastic speed and the high plastic speed. And we have noticed that this, there's a significant effect of the plastic con content, not only on the yield, as you can see, that the oil amount varies with low plastic and in case of low plastic and high plastic, but it also affects the composition of oil. So as you're gonna see the aromatic compounds decreases with increase in the plastic content because most of the plastic is polyethylene, which, is, uh, which gives you straight chain compounds or, or aliphatic compounds. So that affects the quality of oil and also affects the application of oil. So suppose if you are having more uh, aliphatic or straight chain compounds in range of C20 to C30 or like, you know, uh, lower than that, then we can look for its application at diesel grade fuel. But if you are having more aromatics, then we'll try to separate those aromatics and look for uh, the chemical value from there. So uh, briefly about the product analysis, uh, the LP, RDF and the HP, RDF, as I said, low plastics and high plastics. Uh, the composition varies significantly. Uh, like the amount of phenols varies like, you know, from 50, 55 percentage to uh, less than 20 percentage in case of uh, high plastics. <clears throat> As you can see, like, you know, phenol, we have just uh, taken two compounds uh, on which we are currently focusing on for separation purpose. Phenols and uh, like, you know, phenolic compounds, like for example, tuferin methanol. And uh, its percentage varies significantly uh, with respect to the biomass composition. So with more amount of biomass, uh, phenols and tuferin methanol increases in the oil as compared to when we have like, you know, a uh, high amount of plastics. We've also analyzed the char, uh, which is being mentioned on the right hand side. Uh, char tells you about the amount of uh, unconverted material, which is primarily coming from lignin. And uh, that uh, then tells you that what should be our operating temperature to further improve the quality of biochar. So either you can uh, improve the quality of biochar in situ, or then you can do further uh, activation, like chemical or uh, some physical activation later on to improve the quality of char for certain applications. Right now, the char is finding application uh, as a heat source only, but we are looking for different applications. As I said to you, one is uh, using it as an adsorbent, then also for uh, soil condition, depending on its toxicity analysis, and uh, some other application with respect to its carbon value. A uh, brief product analysis of the chart uh, tells you that, you know, it contains a good amount of your nutrients as well, uh, which is coming from the uh, uh, waste. Uh, but the major challenges which we have noticed is the uh, chloride compound which are coming, which are present significant amount, mainly coming from PVC and plastic. So this information has then been shared with the industry to remove plastics, uh, primarily the PVC component of it, because the other plastics are fine. We are okay to take most of these plastics in our feed and then convert into some uh, valid product. But PVC creates a problem with respect to the chlorine compounds going, uh, going uh, in the char, as well as in the uh, your vapor phase, which affects the reactor as well as the downstream operations. Now, calcium is present uh, in high quantity, as you can see, and that is primarily because of the papers. Uh, paper contains calcium, and silica is coming due to inerts, which is the sand material. So, uh, 
this XRF analysis tells you about the composition as well, uh, like, you know, <clears throat> and then suppose that analysis has been carried out, I'll just skip this part. Now the focus on plant design, as I said to you, depending on the low plastic and high plastic. So low plastic is like less than 30 percentage of plastics and high plastic is greater than 60 percentage, weight percentage. And uh, depending on its then its composition, like with respect to how much moisture is available, calorie value, and the proximate and the ultimate analysis, we have defined that like you know what products will form, uh, basically how much bio oil will form, biochar will form, and biogas will form in the low plastic and high plastic RDF products. And then accordingly, we are finding its application. So that is very interesting with respect to design of a reactor for scaling up of a, of a reactor or like an of an overall process. Now I'll uh, briefly talk about the uh, biomass as well, because that is one of the uh, uh, like, you know, areas of interest for the nation as well with respect to agricultural residues. And I think same is there in Australia too, for example, with respect to other kind of uh, uh, waste such as the like, you know, uh, some uh, wood waste, which is coming on the yard waste or the forest residues. So uh, globally around 146 billion metric tons of uh, biomass being produced annually. And that accounts for 35 percentage of any energy contribution in the developing nations. But the problem is that uh, most of this energy is being used in the traditional way, which is just as a heat energy source. The modern biomass application is very limited in most of the nations. So we have done some technology comparison, which technology is favorable for such kind of biomass. So thermochemical and biochemical conversion uh, papers have been published, like you know, uh, in that uh, uh, direction. And then we have also carried out the techno-economic uh, analysis with respect to fuel cost in dollars per uh, gasoline gallon equivalent using different technologies. So as you can see, uh, the lowest cost, which is around 1.43 dollars per gasoline gallon equivalent, is coming with distributed biomass pyrolysis with centralized post-processing or like centralized gasification in this case. So distributed biomass pyrolysis is happening at 5.4 tons per day scale. Or then when you further increase the scale of distributed biomass pyrolysis uh, from 5.4 to 5.55 tons per day, 5.3 tons per day, the cost of fuel will increase. So the primary reason for that is when you uh, have biomass with you, which is again having low bulk density, the transportation cost increases when you are moving it more than uh, 50 kilometer radius. So it is better to have distributed units nearby the biomass uh, production zones, or you can see in the farmlands, in the cooperative farmlands, or in the uh, like other areas where uh, you can actually have the biomass concentrated in a scale of five to 10 tons per day, and then basically treated using uh, pyrolysis and convert into uh, different intermediate products, which you can then further upgrade for uh, finding its application, uh, its commercial applications in the industries. For example, you can take the oil to uh, FCC, to desk catalytic cracker in refinery and then upgrade it. Char can find application uh, not only as a fuel value, but actually as a chemical, as a fertilizer, uh, which we have noticed. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some more uh, information about that. So uh, sustainable solution, as I said, uh, the benefit of pyrolysis as a, as a distributed unit or a decentralized unit is that it gives you advantage of uh, lower transportation cost and the lower capital and operating cost also because of the processing benefits and then the lesser dependency on the environmental constraints. So with variation in the type of feed, you can still have, uh, you can still manage an intermediate product with uh, like, you know, kind of uh, similar properties. When you look at the, again, at the technological strength and the market attractiveness, a uh, few of the technologies or the reactor technologies which are favorable are like, you know, fluidized bed reactors, uh, as well as your, uh, your rotary, uh, rotary kill and auger type of reactor. And then we have carried out detailed uh, studies, like, you know, multi-scale studies have been uh, done from starting from kinetic modeling to particle scale modeling, then the cold flow studies in the reactor uh, for analyzing the mixing and segregation behavior, and then finally your multi-phase uh, reactor model. So a lot of work has been published. Uh, most of you can see that work uh, for the scaling up of uh, processes. Uh, focus of this work is for uh, designing a fluidized bed reactor, bubbling bed reactor. And then further uh, studies have been carried out with the distributed kinetic modeling. And then some of the results of the particle scale model, how the particle size, temperature, moisture content will affect the conversion. So all these uh, studies have been carried out. Then the cold flow studies, as I said to you, to understand the mixing and segregation behavior inside a bubbling fluidized bed reactor. So a big fluidized bed reactor contains your uh, inert media or maybe a catalyst like sand or some catalyst. Uh, and then you uh, like, you know, have biomass which gets mixed with that uh, media 
for uh, basically uniform heating of the biomass particles and uh, like you know a proper uh, heat and mass transfer effects inside the reactor. So uh, a lot of studies have been carried out uh, and seeing the effect of gas velocity and the particle diameter on the segregation behavior. So this is also very important for designing of a reactor. Like what should be the velocity inside the reactor? What should be the particle diameter we should keep? So all these uh, parameters have been studied uh, with respect to the design of a bubbling fluidized bed. And then a, a, a detailed multi-phase model has been developed by integrating kinetic model as well as uh, heat and mass transfer effects with the cold flow model, and then have seen its effect on the formation of products like uh, the oil phase, the non-condensable gases, the biochar, which is forming with respect to different operating parameters like the gas velocity, particle size, and uh, like, you know, uh, also the effect of uh, these parameters on the yield has been studied, like the effect of reactor temperature, gas velocity, and particle diameter on the yield of product. So that gives you a lot of information about uh, the uh, design of that particular system. Then we have jumped onto uh, like, you know, uh, decentralized processing, which is basically working at a particular scale, maybe 10 to 100 tons per day, depending on the availability of biomass. So one such uh, process model has been built. Uh, the work has also been published in Bioresource Technology. Uh, quite interesting work. So we have carried out uh, this study with 100 metric tons per day of Maliwood, which is for the uh, Austin scenario. And um, similar work we are now replicating for the Indian scenario, but with uh, lower capacity systems because of the availability of biomass. So in India, the most uh, favorable scenario with respect to techno-economic feasibility is uh, 10 to 20 tons per day. Because uh, in 50 uh, kilometer radius, that much amount of biomass or agriculture residues available. Uh, for this study, if you're going to look like, you know, uh, we have carried out a series of studies seeing the effect of different operating parameters again. Like for example, uh, the separation behavior, how that will be affected with operating temperature or the dew point temperature in the downstream operations, and also the effect of non condensable gas recycle and the flue gas recycle in the reactor. Uh, how that will affect the overall process design and the overall heat and material balance uh, of the system that helps you in designing the overall plant. Then we've also studied the oil depredation. As I was telling you, we are, our focus is on separation of uh, phenolic compounds, acidic compounds, and also like, you know, levoglucosan, uh, because all these are uh, validated chemicals. So that's a centralized processing uh, has been uh, carried out, mainly to convert that bio oil, which you have collected in the distributed units, transporting it to centralized post-processing units and seeing the effect of uh, different gasification parameters on the syngas, uh, which you are getting. And ultimately, you are converting our syngas through FT and the hydro-processing processes uh, into uh, transport range uh, fuel, like, for example, diesel and naphtha range products. <clears throat> then the overall biorefinery mod modeling, which is the integration with other uh, existing or the uh, like you know planned unit so uh, this is as part of uh, as i mentioned in the beginning uh, that you know we also worked on one asr project uh, the, this is in, in the consortium mode we have worked with qt also uh, with uh, uh, bill johati and then uh, we have uh, partners from uh, other organizations too uh, like from csiro and like you know in from the indian side we have iocl and uh, ict involved in that and we have seen uh, that, you know, how that pyrolysis is an integral component of the overall biorefinery model, which we are building, and how that will affect the overall economics. So we have done a, uh, studies, uh, like you know, integrated studies with uh, other partners, and uh, given different scenarios, like acid pretreatment of biomass, alkali pretreatment of biomass, and then how that will uh, affect the overall economics. Like then, So we have carried out the project uh, uh, evaluation, the techno-economic evaluation, and have given different scenarios to, uh, uh, the government uh, after completion of uh, this work. Now, uh, I'll briefly touch upon this subject uh, because of restriction of time. Uh, just to confirm, like, uh, I still have some time, uh, Prashant. Yeah, uh, Abhishek, you have another five minutes. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, uh, just briefly, I'll mention about uh, the agricultural waste and its effect for the nation, um, like you know, for, for uh, the country. So uh, we are importing crude oil, like around 200 million tons we are importing per annum. Now, uh, in India, we're generating around 686 million tons of this uh, biomass residue, which like, you know, being used for different applications. 
uh, out of that around 234 million tons is available as surplus after uh, taking out the cattle fodder now currently what uh, being ha what is happening is that in this uh, waste is uh, being gen uh, like you know being generated and i said it's a waste because it's been generated it's been treated as a waste and being burned so stubble burning is a common problem in the northern states in the in the country which causes very heavy uh, like you know air pollution during the months of uh, november and december now this residue which is coming from different sources we're going to look like you know this can contribute to around 30 percentage of oil requirement so this is around 60 million tons out of 240 million tons that can take care of your uh, crude which you are importing from the other nations and that contributes significantly to the economy also and makes it uh, self sustainable the challenge though is that you know the harvesting months varies of most of this uh, uh, feedstock so now we have to go for again a distributed uh, processing units we have started with few feedstocks like mustard has cotton stocks rice has groundnut shells uh, see like it carried out its uh, like you know approximate ultimate analysis for uh, like you know categorizing these feedstocks and then doing the uh, this tg analysis for uh, the thermal behavior so this work we have also published recently in one of the uh, journals biomass conversion biorefinery and then we have jumped again on the experimental studies and seeing the effect of different operating conditions like temperature uh, particle size uh, heating rate uh, on the conversion behavior. Uh, so how the oil amount varies with temperature has been shown over here with respect to different feedstocks. Uh, so the oil increases uh, with uh, increase in temperature from 350 to 550 degrees Celsius, but it affects the charred amount. And at the same time, it affects the quality of the product. So as you're gonna see, we have carried out some uh, analysis with the char, and we have seen the char contains a uh, very high amount of nutrients which are useful for the soil other than the carbon value. So what we are doing other than carbon sequestration is also improving the soil productivity using, using these uh, feedstocks. So the, our aim is to put that uh, char in the same soil from where that feedstock is coming. So that will further improve the quality of that uh, soil and has been observed that around 40% of the productivity increases using this uh, biochar, which then uh, reduces the consumption of fertilizers. And that reduction will ultimately affect the consumption of fossil fuel also, which is being used for production of fertilizers. Then further analysis have been carried out uh, for this biochar for certain other applications. I'll skip this for the moment, uh, just for uh, like you know for the time purpose. And then we have uh, analyzed uh, the oil as well. The oil is having a low calfric value. That is uh, primarily because of the high oxygen content in it. So I mean, you can uh, stabilize it. That work is currently going on with uh, one industry. We are working with, uh, with one oil industry to, to stabilize this oil and then use it as a feedstock, uh, as an FCC feedstock. But at the same time, we are looking at the chemical value. So as I said that, you know, it contains good amount of our fuels as well as uh, phenolic compounds and uh, some acidic compounds too, other than uh, like, you know, your liver glucosan and pyrolytic lignin. Now, uh, the focus uh, after that is from, uh, we are currently at uh, like, you know, TRL3 with respect to our TRL3 and 4. We are jumping towards TRL7. We have developed a continuous system as well, as I said it to you. And uh, a lot of work is going in the lab for, for scaling up the overall process. And uh, currently we are working with one industry and with a, with a government, uh, with one government project to put up one ton per day plant uh, in one of the industry site for converting this kind of waste, mainly the uh, solid waste coming uh, from municipalities and getting some valid products from there. Now I'll briefly tell about the distributed scale, uh, like you know how this thing would be uh, beneficial for the society, for the community also. It's not uh, like, you know, that whatever we are talking is with respect to one operation only. That will be beneficial for the nation in totality. And then, then it, it, this uh, whole process will be self-sustainable. So sustainability is very important over here. We have taken one basis of uh, five villages cluster, uh, which is having a population of around 25,000 and land around 5,000 hectares. So that produces around 240,000 tons of biomass from which you will get oil around 30% and 30% uh, percentage of char. And uh, like, you know, uh, with its value in the market, like, you know, what ultimately you will get for the farmers. So uh, we have done some uh, basic uh, costing uh, analysis. And we have seen that the payout period is coming around three years, which is favorable for any scenario. But at the same time, like, you know, what we are generating for the farmers is around 72 crores of uh, rupees, uh, which is a significant value for any farmer, like, you know, uh, in the nation. 
At the same time, it will generate jobs for the uh, for the people. Around thousand jobs will be generated from that uh, land only, which is significant. Right now, only farming uh, is happening, but by putting such kind of distributed units, you can increase the number of jobs in the nation. So that is thousand jobs per five thousand hectares. We are talking over here. The biomass advantage to farmers is significant, as I told you. Extra per capita income for those farmers is either forty thousand to sixty thousand per year. This is again a significant number for farmers uh, who are uh, like you know also struggling with their crops uh, in the nation. So um, an energy produced per cluster, which I told you is around eighty thousand tons. So in total two million two hundred million hectares of land available in the nation, we can generate around thirty two hundred million tons of bio oil, which is higher than what you need. Uh, for the crude oil which you are importing from outside the nation so all these numbers affect the overall economics of the process and makes it favorable for the nation for its self sustainability in with respect to the economy as well as technological aspects and for generating the employment opportunities so with this i'll just end my talk i just want to acknowledge my uh, students like you know my uh, collaborators uh, from industry as well as from government so thank you uh, and uh, with this i'm just finishing my talk any questions you, are, you can ask me thank you yeah thank you very much abhishek for a very uh, nice enlightening talk about uh, particularly your passion of converting waste uh, via your engineering process engineering methodologies and making some meaningful uh, products material a lot of statistical data interesting chemicals you're uh, taking out uh, bio waste and other type of waste so now the talk is uh, open for a discussion. So if anyone of attendee have any questions, so please feel free to type it in a question and answer session. Uh, and then I'm happy to pass to uh, Abhishek about your question. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's open now. Um, and perhaps I, I can start. So I will thank you very much for this um, talk. It was very, very interesting what you are doing there and very important to really uh, reuse um, the waste that you produce in India. Um, I have a more general question. So uh, how is waste collected in India? Is there an established waste collection system or, um, or how does it work in, in India? Or at least yeah. in the state where you are? Yeah, it's a very valid question. Uh... Leonie, I mean, like, you know, we have waste collection system, like, you know, uh, from source. So from a household, like, you know, it's being collected, uh, again, being segregated, like, you know, in the uh, green waste and the, uh, like, you know, non-green waste. But the challenge is, like, you know, uh, actually the segregation doesn't happen properly on site, but you can say at the source. Mm -hmm. And when it goes to the landfill, it's again get mixed. So that is a, a serious problem. Uh, and as well as what happens, I'll tell you, uh, maybe you have read some uh, reports uh, hopefully so uh, there's a lot of mixing also happens and you can say adulteration of the waste also like you know the way we have adulteration in food we have adulteration of waste as well what happens like you know uh, when you're transporting this waste from one uh, place to another place using some uh, like you know transport vehicle so they also add some construction and demolition waste in it just to increase the weight of the truck uh -huh. and that affects the quality of feed so the increase in the weight will uh, affect them they will get more value but the problem is when you're segregating this waste. So as I said to you, that silica is coming in a high amount in the char, in the RDF char, that is primarily because of the inerts which are coming. Though we are segregating, segregating that inert, uh, in industries are doing that before uh, like, you know, uh, preparing their RDF fraction. But even in that, you get a good amount of uh, that sand, primarily because of the moisture content in the feed. So this is, I'm just telling you the real uh, problems which, uh, you know, uh, we are facing uh, while treating this kind of waste uh, for uh, like, you know, for further upgradation. Mm. I and mean, on the uh, same, yeah, on the same line, like what Leonie has asked, like also might be, I mean, in Australia, you also lived here, you're living in India, you might have seen the system, like here, the, the municipality in India or here is the council, they collect the all garbage and people put them in a color boxes and all according to so how that happens uh, in India it might be a bit hard for the uh, like country like India having highly uh, kind of populated. So particularly your city or might be certain state kind of you know implementing it very wisely or nicely, but might be not. I mean yeah, with, with a mass level, it might be a bit 
your challenge. Mm. Yeah, that's true, Prashant. I mean, that is a problem because of that uh, population. And then, like, you know, uh, the awareness is also a problem. So what is happening, though we are, as I said to you, we are collecting at source in uh, two uh, fraction, but even people are just uh, dumping it in, like a single fraction in any of that, uh, like, you know, chambers. So that creates a problem. At source also, there is no proper segregation. So like in the, the plastic waste, people are also putting that uh, food waste mm. in the same, uh, like, you know, plastic bag. You might have seen uh, in India as well. So this practice needs to be avoided. Same problem you're going to find in the village area. So recently we have got one project to put up one plastic waste uh, treatment unit in uh, one of the villages nearby uh, Jaipur. Uh, around 50 kilometers from here because they are generating a lot of plastic waste but they are not properly disposing it off so that's a very major problem other than their uh, water problem so we have actually given a, a, a very big project to the government and they have sanctioned it to put up that plant over there so the problem is the awareness you're right i mean uh, and I the mean, yeah, which we are proposing, yeah we, we are also proposing, right here. yeah leonie and i mean the center is also trying to implement even in our university level to kind of you know classify that waste and carry the green approaches and carry your own mugs and all in a coffee or restaurant place other than creating extra waste. I think it also requires some sort of a fundamentally starting even from primary level, level some courses uh, of this uh, awareness. Uh, without that, the next generation uh, will not be I mean you know well trained. Then this problem will be continuing for next. So it need to go from very fundamentally coursework and awareness. I mean, although we have this three R uh, famous reuse, recycle, repurpose, whatever, but I think still it requires to be a very early stage uh, to get trained citizens and you know next generation. I think it's right. absolute. absolutely. Um, you're talking about multiple types of process engineers. I'm a business person. I was wondering from a commercialization standpoint, which ones were more viable because you also talked about a lot of different material waste streams. So did you see, you talked at the end about how going into the community, um, certain processes could help to start up jobs and lead to, besides employment, other kinds of benefits within those areas. Do you want to comment about that? And the other question I had was about with the biofuels, whether that would be impinging on food security. Uh, right. I mean, let me take up this question first, Judith. Uh, uh, it won't affect your food security because whatever waste we are talking is uh, like, you know, is not uh, competing with your, uh, like, you know, uh, food uh, security. The reason is uh, that the first generation uh, biofuels, which mainly competes with your food generation, like uh, suppose if you are using some oil products directly, which, uh, you know, uh, being generated, uh, like, you know, commercially, and then treat it for biofuels. But over here, uh, we are not doing that. Most of this bio oil, which we are saying is coming from the agriculture residue or the forestry waste, which anyways, like, you know, uh, being mm -hmm. dumped or not being used, uh, like, you know, not in a proper not. manner. Yeah. So that is uh, one thing. Uh, then when you talk about the economic feasibility, I think it's a very uh, good question at this moment. Uh, when we have proposed this whole idea also to the government, uh, because what is happening currently that we are uh, treating most of this waste, this also this agriculture residue and getting ethanol out of it. You uh, must have heard about 2G ethanol, second generation ethanol. A lot of work has happened uh, as part of that ASRF project, which I've mentioned. And also currently few plants are being placed in India too by the government. Uh, the challenge which is coming with the economic feasibility is that ethanol is not finding very high market value currently. And also some of the byproducts of the process are like just being used for combined heat and power. Like for example, uh, they are getting one fraction, unconverted fraction you can say from the process, which gives just uh, like, you know, uh, the heat value and the power value. That's why there is no, uh, not much economic feasibility. Whenever you talk about economic feasibility, what you are interested is in like, like if suppose uh, the feed value is $1. So you, your product value should be at least $10 so that you can take care of your processing cost too. If it is $100, it is even better. It is like, you know, it's very good. So that's why our focus uh, other than the fuel value is also on the chemical value. So as I said to you that we are looking to extract chemicals from there because for example, phenols, they find very high market value because you know they are being used uh, as one of the precursors in the petrochemical industry. Same example, this your char. Uh, so char is sometimes just being burned as a carbon source. But uh, Prashant, I think is a, is a very good example. We're gonna tell you how to use that char for high value uh, or like 
uh, like you know, some value-added product. Like mainly you can use it as like you know as also for a preparation of some electrodes, as well as as adsorbent, which is uh, finding very high market value, and definitely certain other applications on which currently people are working. So ultimate aim is to look at the value addition, how much value addition you are doing. So then the same would be part of your economy ultimately, because that well for that particular com uh, component you are using some other source. So this way it will also be part of circular economy. Okay, thank you. I hope uh, I, I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I have a, one question, Abhishek, in terms of, yes. I mean, you have a, this a complete overview of a different type of waste, and I have seen that I think biochar, I mean, bio-based waste looks like a bit easy to handle uh, because of the nature of contamination might be very less. And then you recovered the bio oil or whatever from the bio, that material and biochar might have some other values in different technologies and taking this domestic municipal waste, which is the mixture of many things like plastic and can be tin and uh, any any some sort of all those. So if you take this process technology part and calculate the cost biochar versus I mean the bio uh, feedback versus the municipal feedback uh, municipal waste feedback. So in terms of the process cost in terms of green approach in terms of the total value what you have prepared the material their quality and all if you see that the complete roadmap what is your impression about like which is the most uh, best approach to get more value for the waste processing to get the value added product which has a higher quality and the less cost so uh, com comparing those these both scenarios municipal waste versus your bio waste yeah i mean again it's a very valid question prashant uh both have their own uh, like you know uh, advantages and disadvantages in terms of the composition uh, uh, municipal solid waste or that rdf fraction is uh, again uh, heterogeneity is there uh, on the other hand this agriculture residue the major challenge which you are getting is the seasonal variation it is significant over there as i said in my slide uh, that with harvesting period like you no know, it varies from mustard to rice husk and you know uh, that will affect the uh, operation and that's why we are proposing this uh, technique and this upgradation technique which is which will act as an at, at as an distributed distributed scale or at a decentralized scale which will give you an intermediate product with some uh, like you know uh, consistent uh, quality so for example in case of uh, biomass uh, this intermediate product which is oil uh, we are getting a good amount of chemicals in that uh, phenols and like you know also your uh, uh, furan methanol and some acids there which currently we are focusing to extract so we are working on the separation strategies uh, at the same time the biochar is of very high quality because it can go back to the soil straight away we have carried out those studies that is a problem with the msw waste you can't take it back directly to the soil because as you rightly point out it contains a lot of other fractions too in the waste itself so there may be possibility of some heavy metal in it for that we have to carry out the toxicity analysis uh, for biomass, that is not a challenge because that you are getting the waste from the same field where you are putting it back, that biochar. So it's easier to do as compared to the uh, municipal solid waste. And now, I, when, I noticed, yeah, I have noticed that from the bio side, like wheat uh, and cotton and uh, another one, three are like kind of almost covering 75% of your bio feed. So it might be uh, kind of, you know, very focused certain crop, not really the all kind of, but I mean, yeah, looking statistical data. Right. No. So we have started with these three and four crops, which are available in the nearby regions. So for example, rice husk, mustard husk, cotton stalks, and groundnut shells. So uh, our aim is like, for example, mustard husk. Mustard is a very common crop in Rajasthan. A lot of regions you want to find mustard. If you're going to put back the char coming from the mustard husk in the same soil, it will improve the productivity of that uh, soil and ultimately cut down the fertilizer requirement. So in an overall sign, it will increase the value of that product. Uh, as you said, from municipal solid waste, that is a, a challenge, but we are also looking for other applications of that uh, char coming from the uh, municipal solid waste. But can we sell them then under the name of organic farming or um, because there's all carbon-based pure uh, biochar, it right. is not synthetic fertilizer, which are manufactured like, you it, know, it is under bio fertilizer and uh, like you know uh, we recently had a meeting with uh, uh, like you know agriculture uh, uh, ministry and they have shown a lot of interest in this kind of projects for the nation now uh, one fraction which is of like you know concern is that oil value so for that we are working as i said to you the chemical value as well as the uh, we're going to stabilize it can use it can be used as a fcc feedstock so it can also find application in the 
existing uh, refineries. Great, good. Leonie, do you have any further any questions? Um, I found it interesting that you said that you also have got a problem with PVC um, because we have the uh, problems with, we don't want to have um, PVC in our normal waste streams as well because a few processes, um, you always get this um, problem with the chlorine content. Mm. And I guess in your case, you will probably also not like it because it will um, corrode your um, uh, your plant. Is that correct? Is that your problem as well? Absolutely, absolutely yeah. correct. And this has happened actually. That's why I'm saying it's very important for researcher to work with engineers as well. Like you know, yeah. So that that's the input we have given to the industry that they have to separate that PVC before yeah. you want to put a one ton per day plant. Or not use PVC at all. Yeah. Absolutely. But actually, it is coming from different kind of waste which are being dumped at the site. So as I said that the industry waste is also being dumped sometime at that site, which uh, causes this PVC being included in the um, that waste stream. Yeah. And I think the content of PVC from country to country, the chlorine content may vary because I think in India might be the most of these uh, pipes and all is a PVC base. Even the farmers are for the water irrigation when water goes to the crop, as well as might be in a household uh, cables and fittings in electrical or whatever other plastic household item, they might have a lot of PVC content there. So I think it is also coming from the policy makers, how much it is allowed. I mean, having this chlorine content uh, severity mm. uh, and then the nation's yeah policy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, in Australia, we use a lot of PVC in construction as well, like in, in water pipes and um, and cables. Um, but that's a different waste stream, so we can handle it better. But we try to get rid of PVC in packaging um, because it's so hard to, um, to segregate it from other plastics as well. Right. So one such example I'll give you, Judith, that PET polyethylene terephthalate, like, you know, the bottles which you're getting. So uh, they find a lot of application in the fabric industry. They are being converted into your fabric, like, you know, all these uh, clothes which you're getting. So the segregation of that is, is feasible. Like, you know, people are what, I think the same is happening in other nations too. We're having certain uh, spaces where you can throw the bottles properly, that PET bottles, and then it being recycled in a proper manner. I think uh, something similar needs to be done for PVC also, if it is being dumped improperly. If it's already be, already being segregated the way you are suggesting, it's fine. But if it's being dumped somewhere uh, through some with some other waste, then proper segregation has to happen over there. Otherwise, it will affect the downstream processes. Uh, thank you very much for a really um, informative talk. Uh, thanks, Center for Waste Free World. Really love your work. Um, I, I'm I suppose I'm coming from a perspective of connecting the dots in research, cross research and industry from different disciplines. Um, and particularly looking at data and mathematical modeling. Um, and yeah, I was really interested by, you know, the, the work that you've done and, um, you know, supporting the economic case for farmers to, for example, improve um, uh, help with carbon sequestration and soil productivity using uh, the biochar and, and, you know, seeing waste as a, a resource. And I was just thinking about some work that's being done by some of our researchers, for example, they're, you know, modeling carbon sequestration. And, you know, I was just talking to them yesterday about whether in their modeling, they're looking at the use of say chemical fertilizers versus, um, you know, <laughs> non-chemical fertilizers or you know compost and things like that from from inverted commas waste um and yeah they thought that that was interesting because they're also looking at you know possibilities of incentivizing farmers because that's uh as i understand happening in australia then i was thinking about an industry collaborator we have uh which is um they use spatial data science and they can do things like um you know work out um you know in, in a particular farm or a particular geographical area, um, you know, where's the fallow land, um, where's the, you know, which crops are being grown, which types, where, and which are under pressure, etc. And yeah, just thinking about sort of bringing all this, you know, together possibly to further incentivize um, farmers to help transition to a more circular economy and, you know, your work's really important. And yeah, just wondering as well if, um, you know, how much data or information is out there um, from a geographical and, yeah, so spatial data um, 
and, and over time, you know, which waste, where it is, um, how much, and just to sort of help, you know, these, these farmers, um, you know, transition um, and, and help, you know, with these, with connecting, um, you know, the different waste streams into, um, you know, better, better uses and so forth and processing. So, sorry, that's a long winded question, but <laughs> I'm just uh, at the stage of, of trying to join dots, but yeah, I, I was wondering if, if any of that is, is interesting, but I, I think your work certainly is, and I'd like to talk to other people about it. Thank, thank you, Judith. Uh, in fact, one uh, GIS tool has been also been built. Like, you know, I think uh, from your group only Q2, I, I remember Phil Hobson was working over there in Australia. And in India also, we have built one such tool, uh, like mainly for mapping of this kind of waste in different regions. So this is a very valid caution. It is very important to understand which waste is being generated in which region and in which period also. So as I've given you some harvesting months accordingly, like, you know, this waste varies, agriculture residue waste. Um, also, the municipal solid waste varies uh, based on the geographical location. So mapping is very important and characterization of this uh, feed, like, you know, waste is also very important for designing your downstream operations. So your caution is very well uh, posed and very, like, you know, important. Oh, I hope I've you. been able to reply. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I was just wondering if you have, um, like, to help link things up, because um, this organization that, you know, is looking at the spatial um, data um, is, you know, primarily in Australia, but across 50 countries. And you spoke of an Indian organization, you know, mapping this, you know, so, so where, when, what, um, and then what can we do with it to make things better? And, and your research fits in there. Um, yeah, if you had the name of that organization, so we're not reinventing the wheel, but, you know, potentially that's, you know, a way to, to collaborate, you know, they might be interested, see what they're doing already. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to be having that information uh, and again, I'll provide you that uh, details. Like, you know, uh... So I think uh, with this, then I'd like to thank Abhishek for uh, attending this early morning uh, talk. Uh, giving the seminar to our, our center and really thankful to all attendee making up this one and really looking forward to have some future opportunities yeah thank, thank you again for your time and presentation today thank you prashant thank you leonie uh, for inviting me